Tonight on the Donlin Report, mandate madness from our military to classrooms to pilots in the sky. I'll speak with a Connecticut teacher named Teacher of the Year at his high school. Now he's been put on leave for refusing the vaccine. Is that fair? Plus, thousands of flights canceled over the weekend, many more today, one week after a major airline instituted a vaccine mandate. Is that a coincidence? You be the judge. I'll talk with a pilot about that coming up. And a U.S. Navy engineer with the help of his wife accused of trying to sell nuclear submarine secrets to a foreign government. The shocking story of espionage, how he snuck the secrets out, is straight out of a James Bond movie, or maybe more accurately, a Skippy commercial. That story and more right here from our News Nation World Headquarters in Chicago. The Donlin Report starts right now. Good evening. We are calling it Mandate Madness. People losing their jobs over it from teachers to airline pilots, even police and our military. That's the pulse of America tonight, starting with the story of Kasim Outlaw. A year ago, he was teacher of the year at his high school in Wallingford, Connecticut. Tonight, he's on leave because he refused to get the vaccine. And he'll join us in just a minute to talk about his reasons. How about pilots at Southwest Airlines? They've asked a court to temporarily block the company from carrying out federally mandated vaccinations until their lawsuit is resolved. Southwest canceled nearly 2,000 flights over the holiday weekend. The airline citing issues with air traffic control and weather. A rep from the pilots union will join us shortly as well. We'll talk about that. And we should point out there's still no official federal mandate. OSHA has not issued any mandate guidelines. And to that point, the federal mandate is really at this point just an announcement by the White House. In Baton Rouge, Louisiana, they are offering to clear the criminal records of ex-cons if they get the vaccine. They're doing this because it's easier to get a job if you don't have a criminal record. And in Seattle, the police department could lose 27% of its already depleted ranks due to officers refusing to get the shot. They've already faced mass resignations and retirements after calls to defund the police in that city. And finally, this headline about our military Hundreds of thousands of them still are not vaccinated or are only partially vaccinated. Despite direct orders, the Washington Post reports 90% of the active duty Navy is fully vaccinated compared to 72% of the Marine Corps. Their deadline is November 28th, so they have some time. The Air Force deadline, though, is three weeks away, and more than 60,000 personnel in that branch are not vaccinated at this point. So what happens if... That many troops don't get the shot. Are they kicked out for not following orders? We're going to speak with one of our military voices. That as well coming up later on in our broadcast. But we begin tonight, as promised, with Kasim Outlaw, last year's Teacher of the Year. And he is, uh, I guess, I don't know, straighten it out for us, Kasim, is that you were on unpaid leave and then paid leave and then unpaid again. What's your status right now? Yeah, we bounced around a little bit, but currently I am on unpaid leave from my school. So what did the principal or, or the district tell you? How did you get the word that this was going down? Um, well, the communications came via email and also with a accompanying letter in the mail. Um, so I've got that information that way, both in writing and on the screen. Um, and we're just waiting to see how this all plays out. So that, that letter said what? If you don't get the shot, you're, you're out? Or what did it say? If I don't comply with the mandates uh, in my district, as they're interpreted, then I cannot be in the school building. So it's taking me out of the school building, away from my students at the moment. Okay, so this was, I'm assuming, given to you as a warning ahead of time as well, right? Did the district send out something that said everyone's going to need to do this? Yes, there were a few emails that came out district-wide that let us know what was coming with some dates. And, um, you know, as it got closer and closer, I'm sure I'm not the only one that had to make some serious decisions, but mine was to kind of go in the opposite direction. Yeah, well, let's get into that a little bit, Kasim, because you have some interesting posts online that we'll share with our folks here, because I know you're uh, into physical education. That's what you teach there at the high school. And this, uh, in yes. your word, is a, it's a lifestyle choice for you. It is. It is. It's, it's really about alignment. And that's one of the things that I champion and always will, um, getting our mind, our body and our emotions all in line with the actions that we take in the world. I'm a, I'm a personal advocate, a big advocate for personal health and the choices that we make with our medicine and with our medical procedures. And therefore, I believe it's, it's my own choice on how to maintain that and how to manage it. Are you opposed to the vaccine? Not at all. Not at all. I, I think it's a personal choice that everyone has to make on their own with the guidance of their friends, family, and loved ones, as well as their medical professionals. 
Okay, tell me about some of your other options, because as I understand it, you did have some at least, right? Because was, was uh, testing on the table as well? Yes, weekly testing uh, was, was an option in lieu of getting the inoculation. But um, again, for me personally, going to test for something that I may or may not have on a consistent basis um, is deemed for me on a personal level an unnecessary medical procedure. You can understand, though, Kasim, where people watching this would say, OK, if you don't want to get the vaccine, I get that. But get the tests. Why not? I mean, at least <clears> then you can teach and go back into the classroom. Well, I had a positive COVID diagnosis back in November of 2020, and I recovered from that quite well. I have not had a symptom or a sickness or sign of illness since then. Um, so that's that's not something that we're talking about right now is, is my ability to kind of have those antibodies and stay in a, in a state of health. Have you gotten the antibody test? I have not. That was not something that was um, asked of me or required of me, and and I and I, you know, it's it's an option, I guess, but mm -hmm. it's not something that I've done thus far. Yeah, I mean, I, I asked Kasim because we've talked about that at length here, and the mm -hmm. natural immunity compared to vaccinations, and it's something that maybe, I, and even we've had doctors and experts on talking about, hasn't gotten enough focus and attention in the national debate. Um, I'm curious mm -hmm. if you were to get that antibody test and you found that you didn't have the antibodies. Would you then get the vaccine? I would not. I would not. I'm, I have a lot of faith and belief in my own body and my, my natural immune response to take care of myself um, and heal from whatever infectious disease that might, might come next. Hmm. So it's not in my, my personal best interest to go get uh, inoculated. Right. Th this has been such a difficult topic for schools, Kasim. You know that as well as I do because you're living it. But uh, when it comes to, I guess, the school environment, you have teachers who are at higher risk. You have kids who are at age where they can't get the vaccine. There's a lot more concern about this. You can see where people watching might think, OK, this is all about trying to keep students healthy, I guess. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's a tough debate. What would you say to them? Well, I mean, for me personally, um, I, I again, I'm a huge proponent for managing my health in the terms on my own terms. Um, when you look at the school building and how we're managing this entire situation, there's a, a question of equity there. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm one teacher standing in front of 30 um, unknown statuses, unknown, you know, health conditions, uh, yet it's relying upon me to maintain that sense of health for everyone. So where do you stand right now? What's ahead for you? Uh, right now, I'm on uh, unpaid administrative leave. We're waiting to see what kind of decision is made by the board and by the district. Um, and until then, I'll be working on a game plan to try to, you know, put food on the table, keep a smile on my face and stay healthy. Right on. That sounds great. Well, you'll always be teacher of the year, right? That 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 will stand. Yeah, um, yeah, hopefully. Hey, good luck to you moving forward, Kasim Outlaw. We appreciate the time. Thank you so much. Joining me now with more on this, Captain Dennis Tager, Allied Pilots Association Communications Committee Chairman. Captain, it's great to have you. I appreciate this because we're going to shift now to the situation in the air and all of these canceled flights that we had over the weekend. I, I guess my first question is a simple one. What really happened? Is th this was a sick out, just no one wants to admit it, right? No, actually, and, and I, I do fly for American Airlines, right. but we're able to address this because we had the same problems at American Airlines over the summer. Management was just not able to connect the pilots to the airplane. During a weather event, when it stresses the system, we should be prepared for that. We have been in the past, but since we've come out of uh, the COVID, the deepest, darkest of the pandemic, into the recovery, our management teams have not given us the tools to get it done when the weather hits like it's hitting in Chicago today. So the Southwest uh, management has actually said it was weather in the FAA. It, it turns out we looked to the Southwest pilots who we speak with frequently, right. uh, and it was the same issues we're having. So yeah, there's some backdrop of discussion of mandates, but clearly on this one, even Southwest management said it has nothing to do with any resistance there, and the pilot union there affirmed that. So we're faced with the same challenges those pilots are, and um, we're, we're very committed to making sure that this doesn't continue into the important holiday season, whether it be weather or this uh, uh, very segregated mandate. Um, we're not making a statement on the vaccine for or against, right. but it's quite arbitrary. Um, we can get into those details. Is it possible someone else did, and, Captain? Is it possible this was an air traffic control situation with the sick out? 
No, actually, the uh, the FAA has said they didn't have any issues, and yeah. evidence of that is no other. We operate in the same airspace, and you didn't see a, a cascading effect on American and other carriers. Right. So this sounds like it was unique to the scheduling of management. They've separated out any thought of the mandate. Um, so um, we're going to go with that, and and we're going to focus on the most important thing, and that's taking care of our passengers and making sure their pilots connected to the mm -hmm. airplane. Because right now. The holiday season, it's uncertain. We saw at American, they did not have the operation um, uh, under uh, uh, hand um, during uh, weather events. We saw it over Father's Day, some 60,000 passengers in one day in August. Three quarters of those flights were because they didn't have the pilots connected to the airplane. So we've got solutions. We just need management to join us, as I'm sure our Southwest brothers and sisters are looking for solutions as well. Right. We're out there with our passengers. We don't want to be stuck away from home. So um, this is a business, but it's also a very delicate human experience. Right. So I guess what I got to get this right. What I don't understand about it, Captain, is is if this were truly a, a weather issue or a, an air traffic control issue, why weren't the airlines impacted equally? Because American, I guess, what you had two percent of flights canceled. Southwest was almost thirty percent of its flights canceled. Why wouldn't it be more uniform? That shows just the collapse of their own ability to run the airline. Um, they, they said they didn't have any other issues. They just could not glue the airline together during this, this weather event. And we've seen levels of that at American Airlines. So something's happened. After COVID, I don't know what they were doing during COVID, but we were ready for the recovery. The jets were ready, but management was not able to get out of whatever muck they were to get the airline running again. Uh, when our passengers were ready, the passengers showed up, we showed up, the jets were ready. But we see time and time again where management says, we got this, we got this. And the words are great, but the actions don't live up to it. How many of your pilots at American are not vaccinated? Do you know? Yes, we do. Uh, we have uh, higher than the general population. We have 70% of our pilots. That's about 10,000 pilots. We represent 14,000. We have 4,000 that are contemplating the decision. Unfortunately, uh, the mandate, which is a lot of people don't understand this, it's a if you're a federal contractor, mm -hmm. um, American Airlines has been designated as such and some other airlines. But you know, when you buy a ticket on American United or Delta, half of the flights are actually conducted by regional affiliates, the smaller airplanes. Mm -hmm. They're not designated as federal contractors. Contractors. So the illusion that, hey, I'm getting on an air airplane that all the employees are vaccinated is, is not accurate. So we've come up at our union with an alternative means of compliance. We're requesting, one, a pause in this, get through the holiday season, and then go with this alternative means by recognizing natural immunity that you mentioned right. and or frequent testing. Uh, so that testing means we keep our passengers safe. You know, we've flown through this pandemic. We made it through. I flew out to New York in the darkest of times. And look at us now. We have people getting on the airplanes. It's full. It's safe. We're masked. It works. So to put this in extra risk on there, and it's not a debate over vaccines. It's a, it's a clear sign of we want this to work. And this mm -hmm. may be a rush to comply for whatever reasons. And it's inconsistent. So let's get this done right and let's do it so that we keep our people flying and also keep them safe and this can get it done so are you saying we're push the, we're ready to roll the deadline captain as i understand it for american is november 24th and i don't need to tell you that's one of the busiest travel days of the year right before thanksgiving so are you saying you should probably try to push that deadline back or because if what we saw this weekend would be uh, i guess just uh, you know a preview of what we would see over the holidays we think that would be helpful. I mean, this is this is what we call an airplane a, 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 a rush to comply, and that never leads to good results. Um, and it's inconsistent, so it's not pure across all of the you know the trains, the the buses. They're not going through this, so it it, it sounds like a great idea, but we're asking for an extension. It gives us time to look at other ways to get this done and uh, protect our passengers like we have during the pandemic. Um, and we talk about those alternative means, mm -hmm. the natural immunity and the, and the frequent testing. We're ready for that. And, uh, and most importantly, you're, you're bringing this in right at a crunch time of the holiday season. And our passengers are ready to fly, visit families, and we're ready to take them there. So with 4,000 pilots, some of them will be getting vaccinated, I'm sure, today. We just don't know how far that's going to go. Um, so we're trying to Get some time in this so right. that we don't let the holiday season slip by us. Certainly understandable. Captain Dennis Tager, Allied Pilots Association Communications Committee Chairman. I know you always get to say it, so I'll say it to you. Thanks for flying with us. <laughs>
We <laughs> Thank know, you for having us. We know you have a it. choice when it comes to your interviews and news stations. All right. Captain, thanks again. Have a good night. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands of our military service members still remain unvaccinated ahead of next month's vaccination deadline. So do we risk losing a large chunk of our armed forces? What if they say no to the jab? We'll get into that ahead. Don't forget, you can follow us on social media at The Donlin Report on Twitter. Continuing the conversation now from our top story on vaccine mandates and how they might be costing some Americans their jobs. I mentioned earlier thousands of U.S. service members still need to get the shot as deadlines to get vaccinated are quickly approaching. So what will this mean for those who don't comply? Joining me now for more, Tony Schaefer, former DOD intelligence officer. Colonel, it's always good to have you. Thanks for the time. A lot of troops, as we mentioned, Thanks, are not, not vaccinated. Um, it's not political in the military, so they have to do this, right? That's correct. And uh, look, I'm not anti-vax. The people I talk to are not anti-vax. There's issues relating to natural immunity. There's issues relating to uh, religious issues and health issues. Uh, Joe, I've spoken to a, a range of people from Navy SEALs to DOD senior civilians, all of which have three concerns. First, uh, is the vaccine going to give me any real immunity? And we just published a paper. Dr. Steve Hatfield, one of our senior fellows, a virologist, points out that the uh, the vaccine itself was designed for a strain of COVID that's extinct. It's gone. That's why you see the diminished uh, eff efficacy in what we're seeing. So that's one question. Secondly, are there things that are going to do think damage? Is there any damage side effects? So that's a concern. It's valid. People have to accept that. And if they and that's the other concern supervisors have. That's why we did this paper. If you're a supervisor, Joe, you order someone to do it, can you be held liable for directing someone to take that? Either military, military is a little bit uh, more difficult right, to sue, think. but civ civilians, civilians you can sue. You can sue, you know, GS employees can sue. So that's the second category. Third category is simply, uh, it, it, does this, is this something that I morally want to be told to do? Is this something I should be directed to do? And that's a whole range of legal issues, which obviously are being litigated in different places. I know of, of at least uh, several attorneys who are now taking on some of these cases. And to, to cut to the chase, there are people right now in the process of saying no. I know a number of people have said they're not going to do it. And there's now a process of counseling that starts. Hmm. So the moment they say no to a directive, either as a military member or a civil servant, there's a, a series of things that kick in regarding counseling, uh, threats of punitive action, and then uh, either dismissal. Uh, uh, they don't, they don't know really how they're going to dismiss right? these people from the military. They don't know yet. That's one of the issues that's not been cleared up. I talked to Representative Andy Biggs the other day. I know Andy and company are trying to make sure that uh, in the legislation on this that they can get a general or honorable if they choose to go down that path. Other civilians are talking about uh, either just leaving the government or retiring. So hmm. that's, the, that's the outs that both, both sides have. Right. So what kind of an impact does that have on the military? I mean, we're talking about 60,000 in the yeah. Air Force, you know, who, are, who aren't vaccinated. What does that mean if they have to, if they have to either get uh, discharged or, or leave? So the people I know are uh, highly qualified. We're talking about some immense uh, human capital that may either be forced out or walk away. And at a time right now, Joe, when we are having challenges, we've talked about Afghanistan, we have other mm -hmm. ones coming up, I don't think it's a good time to be pushing this. For the same reason the airline folks you just talked to talked about, you know, these mandates kind of mess everything up. It's going to have the same effect in DOD, but in a different way. So again, I believe that each individual should consult their medical professional, find out mm -hmm. what is best for them, and then appro approach it that way. The problem is there's no, uh, there's no breathing space, Joe, for that issue. So if you go to your, and I, I know of one cancer, cancer survivor in a three-letter uh, intelligence agency who came to me and said, look, my doctors flat out said, I can't take this, and, and they will not give her a waiver, a cancer mm -hmm. survivor. Joe. Wow. So this is this is really dangerous stuff for individual health. Well, the other bigger question is what could it mean for deployments? That, well, I know there are teams right now uh, of certain flavors that are not being deployed because members of the team have not uh, either been willing to or have not been fully uh, vaccinated. And again, uh, they keep saying, well, the area of operation where they're going, this may be uh, uh, there may be COVID. 
Yes, it's it, the, the pandemic is done. It's an endemic. It's going to be with us. There's, there's multiple strains out there now. Mm -hmm. The question is, does this vaccine give you any leg up better than natural immunity? I know of one Navy SEAL who has three times better immunity based on his having it and come through it than someone who takes the COVID vaccine. Again, we're trying to go with science and what science is telling people. And that's what I think the, the driving force should be, not a mandatory one size fits all. Right. But in September, more military personnel, according to my research, died of COVID than all of 2020, and none who died were fully vaccinated, according to the Pentagon, anyway. Go ahead. So, so again, I'm not, I'm not, we're not anti-vax. Uh, the, the, again, it, it, the issue is, what should it be, uh, what should be best for each individual who has to go through this, and then breathing room and consideration for issues which have impact on health, impact on, on I know a lot of folks who have had it, are happy they had it and are just fine. Uh, my son's a fireman, first responder. He's had it, he's had the boosters, it's fine. And the issue becomes the individuals who have issues, either health related, uh, religious related, or are worried as if they're a supervisor. Joe, I mean, come on, we've, we've all been, we've all supervised people. Mm -hmm. The last thing you wanna do is be civilly sued and have to spend, even if you win, the punishment is actually having to be in court. So a lot of supervisors have asked us to give them some sort of a, an assessment of what are the issues they can use or should approach right. when they direct someone to take it, should there be some sort of right. side effect. Uh, that, these are not small issues. Well, they're not. And uh, as we pointed out along the way here, just even tonight, it's not really even more of a, a mandate issue or a public health issue. It's becoming more of a labor issue and even now spilling into a military issue as well. Uh, that, absolutely. Tony Schaefer, former DOD uh, intelligence officer. Colonel, it's always good to see you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Joe. Espionage, nuclear submarines, and a peanut butter sandwich. The shocking story of a U.S. naval engineer trying to sell our secrets abroad with the help of his wife. It's real, and we'll have that ahead. I'll ask a congressman on the House Foreign Affairs Committee about that incident next. Almost out of a movie script, federal officials say the couple living in this ordinary looking suburban home near Washington, D.C., Jonathan and Diana Tevy, tried to pass U.S. national secrets to an undercover FBI agent. The Department of Justice says the couple thought they were selling designs of U.S. nuclear submarines to a foreign power. Officials say Jonathan Tebby, using his wife as a lookout, placed an SD card concealed within half a peanut butter sandwich at a prearranged dead drop location. Representative Scott Desjardins, Republican of Tennessee, member of the House Armed Services Committee joins us now. Congressman, I guess the first clue maybe should have been the peanut butter sandwich. Is that some savvy spy craft or am I missing something? Well, you know, this is all kind of new and just breaking, but uh, it's really sad to think with all the concerns we have going around the world that uh, we have people from within doing something like this. So I uh, don't know if they weren't very good spies or what, but uh, we take this very seriously and, and we'll see what all uh, transpires. Yeah, the other tip might have been that they were only asking for $100,000. That doesn't seem like much for this kind of information. Yeah, it sounds like something out of an Austin Powers movie. Right, exactly. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Right. Evil. Right, exactly. So how serious, though, uh, we, we, we laugh about it, but how serious could this have been? Congressman? Well, I mean, certainly the Chinese and others are pretty adept at stealing information as it is uh, through cyber attacks. So certainly we don't need people helping, but uh, you know, not since you know, maybe the Chelsea Manning uh, incidents where they were leaking all kinds of information. Uh, have we seen uh, something quite like this, but uh, we always got to keep your guard up and mm -hmm. uh, you just got to be very careful who you give security clearances to. Right. Is there any more on, on the country or the circumstances that were involved? No, I mean, like I said, it's it's kind of breaking news and, and we haven't been briefed in a classified setting on it yet. So unfortunately, I can't give you really any more information than what we're reading in the news. But I guess I wonder, is it possible for us to learn that? Will we ever know, do you think? I don't know whether this person is accused of this, whether it comes out or whether the FBI is able to get to the bottom of it. Right. I'm sure that there will be more to come. Anything that's on a classified nature, obviously, it has that uh, that classifying for a reason. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, we'll keep a close eye on it, see uh, if any damage was done, and uh, we'll, uh, you know, report what we can.
I guess the good news, if there is any, and if there's any comfort in this, is that it, it, it appears we did stop it. Right. It, it, it appears so. But uh, as you said, it was a small dollar amount relatively by a day's standards. And, and uh, the, the whole story seems kind of surreal. Yeah. Uh, let's get you on some things we've been talking about here, Congressman, namely the, uh, the fact that politics has become sort of sport, if you will, with winners and mm -hmm. losers and keeping tabs. Uh, Senator Kirsten Sinema on her Twitter page touts herself as an ultra marathoner and, and Boston qualifier, which she ran today. But Twitter, uh, of course, as it does, had some fun at her expense, saying she's used to running from her constituents. Uh, there were groups saying that they would bird dog her at the marathon, and I haven't heard whether that actually happened, but I guess there are some pictures of groups that had gathered there. Uh, she's been chased into bathrooms and she's been chased through airports. You've had your own controversies, Congressman. Where is the line on this with policy or campaigning? Well, it doesn't seem like there's much of a line at all. And uh, there are legal protections, like for uh, Senator Sinema to be chased into a bathroom in Arizona. I believe that's illegal. But I guess chasing around airports and bathrooms not enough. They tried to chase her on a marathon. I hope she made them follow. But I do believe that they were uh, protesting and had signs. Uh, it, it, it seems like the lines are pretty, pretty blurred right now. Clearly, she was the first Democrat to be elected in Arizona in 40 years, and she ran a pretty clear campaign as a moderate. That's a swing state, as we all know. And I don't think she ever intended on being Schumer or Pelosi's puppet. So good for her for standing up for the principles she ran on. And, you know, you can't please all your constituents. That's why we have elections. But, uh, you know, she's holding firm to the, the commitments she made when she ran. Right. Uh, comedian Bill Maher talked about this as well. We're going to play a clip of here and we'll get your comment after. A gang of Gen Z activists followed her into the bathroom started yelling at her in the bathroom while she was peeing. <laughs> and then they went back to demanding that we make campuses a safe space. Uh, I didn't know that word was coming, but uh, either way. So I guess the question on this is what we've been seeing, Congressman, is a lot of folks taking advantage of social media and, and, and appears to be looking for these, these sort of gotcha moments. Do you think that's become more of what's become the barometer, if you will, even more so than the ballot box? Well, there's no question. Social media has become a real challenge, and that's why big tech is under such scrutiny. But I do find it interesting. A self-professed liberal like Bill Maher has been using his platform now for weeks to go after the failures in the current administration and after the, the far left liberals who seem to be running the party. I, AOC and Omar and Tlaib and, and others are dictating the policy. And that, frankly, is not what, you know, probably even the Democratic Party wants. So when you have a liberal like Bill Maher saying that he's embarrassed by his own party, it shows that there's real trouble uh, in Washington when uh, you have an infrastructure bill that's very popular among uh, the, the Democrats and, and moderate Republicans that could have passed you know, a month ago is being held hostage. Uh, to this this massive spending bill, it just shows that the Democratic Party has really lost its way and it's listening to the wrong people. It doesn't seem like the president's in charge. We don't know where the vice president is, but um, you know, clearly something's got to give with this infighting and it's right. uh, the, the tail wagging the dog here and uh, the old uh, bird in the hand versus two in the bush. They're, they're going to probably lose infrastructure if they're not careful and, uh, and get nothing, which, you know, frankly, the way that they're spending and, and the way our debt is and where our debt ceiling is at, uh, people who spent all their life paying into Social Security and Medicare at risk of losing these things because of this uh, increase in radical spending proposals that we're seeing, Green New Deal and all these new social dependency type programs are going to dilute out uh, the money that's there for the people that spent all their life uh, paying in. Right. Bit of a break in D.C. What are you looking forward to the next week or two? What should we have our eye on? Well, I mean, you, you got to keep an eye on uh the spending bill first and foremost because it's three and a half trillion dollars that the infrastructure bill is a trillion dollars right and you don't uh, think you know, the that, spending bill ends at three and a half trillion though do you congressman uh, no i don't think it passes and i think that uh, you know they're finding out all kinds of things like the the student debt repayment and other uh, things wish lists that they have put in this bill are not going to be paid for so that you know bernie sanders and company wanted six trillion and they don't want to come down they think 3.5 trillion was a compromise but clearly with uh, joe manchin and kirsten cinema yeah, that's an unrealistic number so they're going to have to start paring away 
uh, this this social wish list. And, you know, I, I think the, that maybe the Democratic Party needs to branch out and have a socialist wing, because honestly, that's what we're seeing. And that's what people, uh, Democrats and Republicans need to look out for in Washington is how they're fundamentally changing. Uh, they're trying to fundamentally change what this country stands for. And, and really, we're kind of in the fight of our lives uh, for the future of our country right now. Right. So watch the next few weeks and let's sure. hope that somehow we can stop uh, th this in incredible massive spending increase after we're just trying to recover from six trillion in spending from COVID and we're still having trouble getting people back to work and right. we've really created an entitlement society worse than we've had before well, and we know uh, yeah what what could happen is just going to make it worse right we know uh, that you've given us a shout out on News Nation so uh, in fairness both parties definitely have their wings that's for sure to deal with Congressman Scott Najar Lay of Tennessee House Armed Services Committee thanks for the time Congressman. Certainly, Joe. Thank you. You bet. Take care. Gabby Petito reported missing one month ago today and tonight. The manhunt for her fiance continues. Where is Brian Laundry? And will law enforcement ever track him down? Plus, much more. Elon Musk moving his electric car company, Tesla, the headquarters to Texas. He also recently moved to the Lone Star State himself. And he's not alone. Will Texas eventually become just like California? Politically, socially, and interesting opinion piece on that ahead and we'll talk with the author meanwhile in california you may not be able to allow or may not be allowed to mow your lawn if your mower is gas powered would that ever happen in texas shot and killed in the line of duty on his first day on the job. 26-year-old Georgia police officer Dylan Harrison was ambushed in the early hours of Saturday morning. Investigators say Harrison, the father of a six-month-old baby, was targeted for arresting another man. Police have arrested his accused killer. Attacks on police officers and unrest in American cities contributing to an historic number of police officers leaving the job. In Minneapolis, as of this summer, approximately 200 officers turned in their badges in the wake of George Floyd protests. Meantime, following calls to defund police, cities are now pouring money back into their departments. New York boosting its police funding by 200 million. Los Angeles bumping the budget 3%, both changing course amid rising crime rates nationally. Does it reflect a shift in public sentiment about police and policing? In a recent interview, noted actor Morgan Freeman called police and the work they do necessary. I'm not, I'm not in the least bit for defunding the police. Uh, police work is, uh, aside from all the negativity around it, it is very necessary for us to have them. And uh, most of them are guys that are doing, uh, doing their job. They're going about their day-to-day -day jobs. So Stephen Rogers joins us now, retired police lieutenant in New Jersey. Stephen, it's good to have you back. I guess let's start with your reaction to Morgan Freeman's comments there. He says Minneapolis is basically getting ready to change its police department fundamentally to a department of public safety. What do you think of his comments? Well, I believe that uh, he's, he's being truthful. Uh, the fact of the matter is he's talking about something that is unpopular, uh, especially amongst Democrats and liberals, uh, where you have to defend the police and not defund the police. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, crime is escalating across the country. Uh, it will be very, very uh, catastrophic in Minneapolis if they replace their police department with anything else but trained law enforcement professionals. So cities are now refunding police because of the cuts that they have tried to make not working. Where do you think this goes in Minneapolis? Because it's a big vote and it will lead to big changes. They're talking about limiting the size, scope and influence of the police department. Well, it's going to go uh, perhaps the way of Chicago, unfortunately. Uh, I really believe that uh, we're going to see more bloodshed in the streets uh, of Minneapolis. Uh, police officers are now uh, hindered uh, from doing the job that they need to, to, to do. And I think Morgan talked about that. Uh, when you uh, uh, replace police officers with, and this is what they want to do, with mental health experts, with soci uh, sociologists, uh, with social workers, you're looking for a lot of trouble. Could you imagine? And let me just give you an illustration. I can't begin to tell you how many times I went to domestic violence calls where a husband and a wife are having an argument and was escalated into a near homicide. Uh, so the idea of defunding the police and getting rid of the police is only going to cause more harm 
to the very people who are going to need the police when there's an emergency situation. You mentioned uh, Chicago. Here's a couple of comments actually from Chicago, and it could be the case anywhere for that matter. But Alderman Brian Hopkins said if crime continues to increase in Chicago, I think you'll start to see the economic recovery stall. And here's what hedge fund CEO Ken Griffin said. It's becoming ever more difficult to have this as our global headquarters, a city which has so much violence. I mean, Chicago is like Afghanistan on a good day. And that's a problem. So, Steve, you mentioned it. I mean, how do you balance the demand for change with the need to fight crime, which is increasing? Well, you balance it in this manner. Yes, there needs to be uh, some reforms made uh, in law enforcement. But when we talk about bail reform, where you're releasing criminals uh, one hour after they're arrested, when you talk about defunding the police, that's not the solution. The solution is, and I've said it all along, and law enforcement practitioners for years know this, is community policing. Get the cops back out on the streets. We know who lives in the neighborhoods. We know who's going to school. My goodness, when I was running community policing units, we knew about everyone in every neighborhood in every town across our state. Mm -hmm. So that's how you balance it out. Educate the public about the police, the police about the public. It works. Why they did away with that? Well, here's your result. Stephen Rogers, retired lieutenant in uh, New Jersey. It's good to have you again. Thanks for your time. My pleasure. Thank you. Now to the latest on the manhunt for Brian Laundry. Today marks Gabby Petito's mother uh, reported her daughter missing to police on Long Island, New York, 30 days since that happened. That's where the 22-year-old grew up and later met Brian Laundry, who still remains missing to this day. Joining me now with the latest on the search for Laundry is News Nation's Brian Enton. He's been on this for weeks and months, and uh, he has the latest now on what happened overnight there at the house where you've spent a lot of time over those, uh, those last weeks. Yeah, we've been here, Joe, and the parents, Chris and Roberta Laundry, they haven't been out in days. Yesterday, basically, someone showed up. We see all sorts of weird and bizarre stuff here. Someone showed up with a ton of laundry baskets and just started throwing them all over the lawn. Uh, apparently, that upset the laundries. Around 1 o'clock this morning, for the first time in four or five days, they came out of the house went out onto their lawn uh, and very, very quickly picked up all of those laundry baskets. They also took down a poster of Gabby uh, that was put on the front lawn, and then they took everything, and they went back inside the house, and they haven't been out back outside since, Joe. We're also seeing more on these memorials that are popping up, right? It's, we mentioned it's been one month now since Gabby disappeared. Yeah, there's a really, really nice, beautiful memorial here in Northport. It's about five minutes from where we are uh, at Northport City Hall. That's sort of the main memorial. People have been coming from all over the country there to leave messages and flowers and candles. Uh, the parents, Gabby's parents, were actually over at this memorial over the weekend, uh, taking a look at it for themselves. We're told that because of the rain and the climate here, uh, tomorrow the city is going to start taking the memorial down, carefully boxing everything up uh, and bringing it to Gabby's parents. All right, Brian Itton, live in Northport for us. Brian, thanks again for the update. Thanks, Joe. Busy weekend for California Governor Gavin Newsom signing into law three pieces of legislation, one requiring retailers to have a gender neutral toy section. Another bans the sale of gas powered lawnmowers and leaf blowers by 2024. And the third requiring students to take ethnic studies classes before they can graduate high school. These new laws coming on the heels of Tesla founder Elon Musk's announcement that the company will pull up stakes in California and move the headquarters, at least, to Texas. Our next guest published an op-ed in the New York Times this weekend titled, Texas is the Future of America. So let's get more on this. Steve Pedigo is a professor at the University of Texas, Austin. Uh, it's great to have you. So if Texas is the future of America, that can be taken a lot of different ways. Let's start with what you meant by the, the headline. Sure. I think if you look at the growth of Texas in the last 20 years, particularly looking at the U.S. Census, what you realize is that we are leading the country in population growth. Uh, from 2000 to 2020, we've added about 8.2 million residents. We're becoming much more diverse. Much of that diversity is being, much of that growth is being driven by diversity. 95% of that growth is people of color. So as, as the U.S. becomes more diverse, more urban, more, more metropolitan, we're seeing those same uh, trends happen here in Texas as well. Yeah, it's booming. And as you point out in the article, it's interesting, the four big major metro hubs are the ones that are driving a lot of the growth. And you say that may not work out the way many people in Texas might think. 
Yeah, I mean, in Texas, we call that the Texas Triangle. If you look now, about seven in 10 Texans actually live in San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, Fort Worth, and Houston. Mm -hmm. And I think what's interesting as you look at our policies here in Texas is that as we're moving our policies become more socially conservative, perhaps one could say, our population, again, is becoming much more diverse, much more urban. And so that actually runs maybe counterintuitive to what we're seeing coming out of the state house, actually. So do you think that means that Texas will become California, essentially? No, I, I don't think that Texas becomes California. I think that, again, one of the things that's made our state really fantastic is we've been a state that has embraced the private sector, and our private sector has actually been at the public policy table. One could argue in California, as I write in the New York Times, that actually is not the case. So one of the things that we have to do to make that not happen is ensure that our private sector stays at the table as we're thinking about looking at policies. And so as companies like Tesla and others expand into Texas, we have to be asking ourselves, how are we putting forth the right types of policy that are going to ensure they were able to attract and retain the talent that those companies need to grow and scale. All right, well, let me ask it a different way. I'll call on a blurb from the article that, that I pulled. As long as Texas continues to grow, Republicans see no downside to it, but it seems to me and many other Texans that they're making a fatal miscalculation. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, one of the things that's been so great about our state is we've been open to all types of people here. And if we continue to become much more socially conservative in policies that maybe hinder re reproductive rights, uh, the attack on tra uh, transgender kids and sporting, those types of things, mm -hmm. those, signal, um, you know, those signal issues of not having to a tolerant environment for different types of people. And so one of the things that I, I worry a lot about is how do our companies attract and retain talent when you're potentially putting social policies in front that become uh, maybe a signal that we're not as open open and welcoming to people that are as diverse uh, that are, as our workforce needs. Right. So if these, I mean, maybe you could look at it like a lot of different states that have a major metropolitan area that sort of drives the politics in a state, uh, thinking particularly uh, of Chicago and Illinois and how it often carries the day. Portland does the same thing in Oregon a lot. Um, do you think that uh, Dallas, Houston, San Antonio and Austin will ultimately do that and turn Texas blue if this is the trend that you're on? I think we're going to see Texas turn purple before we turn blue. But yes, I think we, we absolutely start to see Texas become much more um, in play for, for, for Democrats as we look towards uh, the future. Again, when you look at the growth of Texas, our metropolitan areas grew about 18% over the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. Our rural communities grew less than 1%. So all of the growth is happening in our urban and metropolitan areas. We have to believe that those are most likely are going to be more progressive, more democratic votes right. possibly. All right, Steve Pedigo, you'll find his work in the New York Times today. Great to have you with us. Thanks. Appreciate it. Great. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's tonight's American Snapshot, a very prestigious award will be given to one lucky kid tonight. The Mullet Championship. That's our Snapshot next. In tonight's American Snapshot, a crucial vote, and it ends tonight at midnight, talking about the Kids Mullet Championship. 500 kids vying for the title of Mullet Champ. Here are some of the entries. Neil here, rocking the camo to support the troops. And then Sawyer, he looks, uh, there's, there you go, there's Neil. And then we've got Kenny Powers look-alike here. This, there you go, that's beautiful, that's Corbin. He kind of reminds me of someone, actually. Um, do we have, yeah, look at that. Oh, yeah. That's, those are the old hockey hair days. Leland's next. Have a good night.